to a website, a blog, you are, you are creating social media usage. And that's going to be important in just a little bit. We'll talk some more about that in a minute. So, oh, I think I took your slide, Anastasia, but I'll do this one and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, so, social media is important in our life. Um, even if you don't do, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, as I mentioned, if taking a quick peruse through your smartphone shows that you probably use social media more than you think. And so the one thing I, I want you to do is hashtag important today, and that's really expand your idea of what constitutes social media. It's going to be important for the presentation and for you as a counselor. And so we use social media in our life, this very expanded version of social media, to gain knowledge and insight, to communicate with other people, to leverage opinion and to network. Even if you're just scrolling through in the mornings with your morning uh, beverage and toast and you are, I say beverage because I don't drink coffee, um, you're just scrolling through and you're reading some stuff from the Huffington Post, you are still engaging in social media. Um, so yesterday um, I did a presentation around holding existential space. And I had done some research the week prior, and yesterday on my Facebook, two articles showed up around holding space. And one was around attending a workshop around holding space. And so everything that we do in this expanded view of social media is very, very, very much connected and very, very influ much influences what we see on our social media and then how we react to what we see. So I just covered that one. How many, how many apps do you use? So I mentioned our digital identity and that is this very connected, um, I want you to think of it like a ball of yarn that you just toss all over the place. It's all of the characteristics um, by any digital subject. Um, and I mean any because we are in this, in this day and age, we have um, toddlers who are two and three years old who have larger uh, digital identities than people who are um, in their 50s or 60s. Why do you think that is, that, that this, this overlay of yarn, all of this digital uh, information about us, this big tapestry that is our digital identity, why do you think it is that, that children have larger um, digital identities than, say, their... their um, older contemporary, maybe in their 50s or 60s. Why do you think that is? And if somebody answers, I can't see you. Anastasia will have to tell me. So, they don't get a choice, right? Kids don't get a choice about what's posted about them, but moms, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, um, we all post. Um, about the happenings in our life, um, giving people like the ultimate unfettered access to what what goes on. Um, you know, I was reading something in preparation for this, and um, you know, they they took uh, like the number of posts on a given uh, day in, on Facebook that were set to public, and forty two percent of people who posted on that given day and it was public so they could see it posted about mundane every day going to the gym having coffee eating lunch um sort of thing and so we we live in this in, in this place um in our social media lives where we share everything and so our digital identity is huge and it's maintained um by those things what did i eat for lunch Who's looking at me? What, you know, what's kind of going on? Who likes what I'm doing? Who, um, who sees what I'm doing? All of those kinds of things. And so um, I found this graphic that really, really represents and typifies this. And it's called, um, well, if I can get it to move. It's called the ego system. And, and with me in the middle and then all of my social media um, profiles projecting out into the world. And so uh, I hope you're getting the sense that with social media, nothing 
is private. Um, Dr. Foster, um, Don gave us some feedback in the chat box. She said, um, that's the only way they know how to communicate as the older generations have had to learn this way of communication. Um, say more about that, Dawn. Um, Hi. Um, I think that as when when we were younger, we didn't have social media. So we went out to play, you know, we used the telephone. Um, and now kids have Xboxes, they have cell phones or tablets with Wi Fi, and their friends or family are easily reachable that way. It's simpler, they don't have to go anywhere. I don't like to use the word lazy, but they're just able to communicate with their friends and family much easier than we did. So it's just a different way of communication um, than we're used to, but that's all they know. I, I would also challenge though that um, because of the very technologically connected world we live in, it's becoming a mainstay. I mean, think about where we are and what we're doing in this moment. We are online having a virtual conference and sharing information. We are leveraging insight and knowledge today. And so I would say that um, that's absolutely true, that it's a different way of communicating. But I would say that it's pervasive and it's here to stay. And so I would also say that technology has outpaced our understanding of how to use it in term, how to use it appropriately. Definitely. Now, if this this was a conference that I had to travel to and miss work, um, I probably wouldn't have been there. But, you know, so it does, it's needed, it's necessary, and we're able to get so much more information out. Very, very quickly. Yes. So there's this instantaneous piece to our digital identities. There's this very instantaneous piece to the use of, of technology. And, you know, in, in previous times when you're sitting in front of someone, you're able to really kind of monitor and really appreciate the nonverbals of that particular um, interaction. And, you know, with the use of technology, we can't always do that. And so, um, I, I'm, I'm hoping this video works. If not, I'm willing to, to stop sharing my screen for a minute and find it because it's really important to me that I show this to you. Um, Dr. Foster, uh, Tanisha Jeffrey says accessibility and we are able to reach people who would never show face. And Dr. L.A. says that is exactly why we do this virtually. Um, let me I've been unable to log in as the host at this point so uh, the recording is not going on from my end um, I'm trying to see if I can get this uh, and if not I'll pull it for the end um, um, Eve it says you are recording um, we'll come back to this video um, because it's not necessarily pulling right now but it's um, I think that after we talk about the ethics of social media use for for us as counselors, I think that this is going to really punctuate that. So um, who knows, it may be better off later in the presentation anyway. Um, but with the power of social media, um, with the, also comes ambiguity and fallout and, um, things we wish we could take back and the unfortunate truth around social media is once you hit the button um, to post something or to look at something you know it's always part of your digital footprint again we live in a world now where the digital footprint of people under the age of 18 outpaces the digital footprint of people who are in their 50s to 60s two to one um, and we also live in an age where the things that are said about you outpace the things that you post about yourself two to one, meaning that 
somewhere out there, somebody is generating something about you in a database that you are potentially unaware of. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, Don says it's also instant gratification, which can be good and bad. Uh, hold and on. I think we made the, um, I think we made the uh, video work. Did you guys see that? Let's go back real quick. I think we made the video work. Yeah, we did. Can you guys hear that? So what, if anything, in that video resonated with you? Anybody? Did anything? Did you see anything that's kind of technologically and culturally relevant? Uh, Don said he felt he had to pretend to be happy. Anybody else? What kind of things were was he posting about? Like everyday life, right? Drinking, relationship, job, Don stated. Drinking, relationships, jobs, life. And the reality of the situation is, is that um, nothing we do online is protected. And so, um, you know, we live in a generation like where we kind of express ourselves online and we look for, we look for um, our tribe online to really kind of support and feed us through relationships, life, jobs, all of it um and so that creates kind of this really um interesting uh, phenomenon called this online disinhibition effect where people feel more comfortable doing and saying things online much like he did um than they do face to face and what that creates is a couple of phenomenon that counselors really need to be aware of one is that you don't know me um, because you don't know me, I can say whatever I want to say online and it's really, really going to be okay. Um, that you can't see me <laughs> again, 
not only do you not know me, but you can't see me so I can say or do uh, whatever I feel like I need to do. Um, you know, the see you later, you, you know, with the asynchronicity of, of being online, we often think that um, we can, uh, we're not in the same parallel plane as other people who are viewing the things that we do online. Um, you know, the, it's, it's all in my head. Uh, it's just a game. And then the we're equals um, that we feel compelled to believe that we can interject however we, we feel we need to and we can say the things we want to say. Um, and that, you know, the playing field's super level online and like everybody's going to receive it exactly as I meant it to be. And so um, even as counselors, we, we really have to check ourselves in, turn, in terms of our awareness about what we're putting out there into the world uh, because of these things. We may think, my clients don't know me. They'll never find me. Okay. Um, tell me how that works out for you because I've never, um, you know, we're naturally curious people and the internet is a wonderful place for us to find everything we want to know about someone. And so um, if, you, if you ever intend on advertising yourself as, as a counselor online, if you know, somebody writes a post about the services they've received. You already have an online thread in your in your counseling life that connects who you are as a counselor to who you are as a person. And so I want to raise the question here in terms of awareness and, and bias. Um, feel free to jump in, anybody. Do you believe that counselors um, are entitled to having a different uh, online persona than that of them being a counselor? Do you feel like they should be able to have their personal persona and their professional persona? And will that ever bleed over? Um, Tanisha says uh, in response, uh, there are people that are more comfortable emailing, sending a text or watching a virtual conference for information. People that are afraid, sensitive, shy are more likely to reach out in a more private or anonymous way until they find someone that they are comfortable with. And um, Eve says, absolutely, in regards to your question. So Eve, absolutely in terms of we should have two separate personas or absolutely in terms of there's gonna be bleed over? Um, I think absolutely we could have two separate personas, one that uh, is done under some fictitious name and than one that is our counselor identity. And we're going to talk a little bit about really if you do intend to have um, a persona online, um, how to separate that out um, in part of the ethics um, section. And, just says, um, that, and the reason I ask this is because it gets pretty tricky. Um, because your clients are going to look for you online. It's not a matter of if they look for you, it's a matter of when they look for you. Um, and so it's as easy as opening um, you know, a browser tab, putting in your name um, and searching for you. Um, in preparation for this presentation, um, I needed to find somebody who um, not as a client or anything like that, somebody in my personal life who I had lost contact with. It had been probably 11 years. And so I documented how easy it was to find her for the purpose of this, um, for this presentation. All I needed to know was either her name or an email address, and I could find out anything I wanted to know about her. Um, and our clients have the same tools at their disposal to do those things, and so yes, I mean, in a perfect theoretical world, everything is going to remain separate. There's going to be no backflow. There's going to be no bleed over. Um, you're going to be able to keep all of your things private. Your clients are going to be able to only see the things that you have public. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, I challenge you to really frame the rest of the presentation in that that is not always the way it is. Um, Tanisha also says, as a person, you have to ha you have the right to your freedom, but you have to understand that it can bleed over. Ethically, you have to always be aware of your actions and what you say. Um, and I'm, that is a wonderful, appropriate segue to the next part of our presentation. So I'm actually going to um, turn it over to Anastasia.
if I can make the slide, there we go. Anastasia, are you ready to take us away? <clears throat> the ethics of it all for, for counselors. Oops, sorry. Um, legal issues. State counseling boards are still in the early stages of developing their rule about the use of social media communications between counselor and client. As such, it is recommended that licensed counselors and counselors in training who use Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or other social media check in with their state licensing board on a, on a periodic basis to stay updated on current rules and regulations. Um, word of caution, the Ohio Counselor, Social Worker, Marriage, and Family Therapist Board sanctioned a licensee for activities related to her Facebook account. Um, you notice here it said her Facebook account. It did not indicate whether or not it was her public Facebook, her private Facebook, um, just what she did on social media. Um, there were sanctions. And so a good question here, Anastasia, is how many of you know what the laws are in your state around social media use? And even more granular for the students on the call, how many of you know the university policy or our program policy about social media use? And so when you're writing down takeaways, um, be sure to list those things out and star them in terms of this is what I need to do next. Um, I need to find out where my state, where my university, where my program stands with this. Go ahead, Anastasia. Um, information shared by a client and clinical impressions are as confidential as the name of the client. Therefore, describing a client's presenting problem, diagnosis, or your treatment approach through online discussion form, even if you do not give the client's name, is a violation of confidentiality. Uh, thinking of it this way, online discussion forums are public and therefore open to anyone, regardless of their background. As such, presenting case material through electronic forums is like going to a street corner and asking the people who pass by for a consultation. Your clients would probably no more appreciate being discussed on a discussion forum than they would on a street corner, even if their names were not in use. And Dr. L.A. said the T. CSPP social media policy is in our student handbook, accessible through the advising forum. I appreciate the, the hint there, uh, Dr. LA, in terms of how they should get to it. And so um, that might be a great place to start, is to start with uh, the TCS policy and then look at your state policy, especially since um, she gave you a, a, a hint as to where to find that. Um, so moving on. I can make it go. So, is corresponding through social media legal? We've given you a hint, much like Dr. L.A. did, in terms of what your state may say. 24 licensing boards report the absence of any law, rule, or regulation uh, regarding the use of internet with clients. Therefore, it's assumed in these states to treat electronic messages between counselor and client the same way you would treat face-to-face -face communication. Um, it's kind of like that um, street corner analogy that we just used. And so if you live in the states of Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, or Wyoming, this applies to you. Uh, what I would challenge you to do is to call your board, ask for current legislation, even if you are a, a, a student and you say, well, this really doesn't apply to me um, now, that's not the case at all. I'm gonna give you a, an example of someone, um, not in my state, but from one of these states, um, she was in her internship and um, the place where she did her internship misrepresented her credentials um, on their website and she was sanctioned for it the agency was sanctioned for it um, and and she basically had to her university made her restart um, her practicum but only after going through a sanctioning board with the university and so know your state policy, especially if it's ambiguous, um, as it is in many of these states, call the board, uh, get, a, 
get a, um, an opinion about, about things. Um, 10 states regulate electronic communication for counselors uh, limited to their particular state. If you live in the state of Arkansas, California, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Nebraska, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, or Utah, um, there's probably a more uh, specific law you can look at, but the same rule applies. Go to your state board, go to the website, ask for what this looks like. Um, because the other thing that I really want to caution us with is that um, we talked about digital footprinting and how big, how massive um, someone's digital footprint can be. Anastasia and Ashley and I, we, our digital footprint got bigger today just because of the conference, because our names are, are in a conference uh, uh, presentation brochure that is, is published online. And so it's now become a part of our digital footprint. Like I said earlier, sometimes we put it out there about ourselves, sometimes other people do. Uh, the bottom line is that you are responsible for everything about you that is generated um, on social media. And, you know, for instance, in my state, there's a policy around that that says if you see something online that is written about you, whether you wrote it or not, it's your responsibility to take care of it kind of thing. And so know your state law. Um, four states um, specifically state that they do not support electronic communication under the scope of practice for professional counselors. Uh, that's Maryland, New Mexico, Tennessee, and Virginia. And so understand what the law is there. Um, recognize that, um, you know, it may impact the way you use social media. Um, Anastasia. <clears throat> HIPAA should be attended to when interacting with clients through social media. The biggest ethical issue revolves around the potential for a breach of confidentiality or invasion of privacy. One method for avoiding potential conflicts with HIPAA is to make sure that social media contact with the client does not contain session-related disclosures or diagnoses and treatment information. A second method for addressing HIPAA privacy requirements is to get written permission from your client to interact informally through Facebook, text messaging, and other electronic methods since HIPAA permits clients to authorize non-routine disclosures. Um, in regards to the first statement of um, the biggest ethical issue revolves around the potential for breach of confidentiality or invasion of privacy, uh, Dr. Foster, I think it might be important to bring up I don't, I can't remember if it's in there or not. Um, just because your privacy settings on Facebook are set to one thing or another thing, you know, that doesn't mean it's private. Um, absolutely. Um, we're going to go through a tool um, at the end of the presentation and everybody can have access to the tool. I've included it in the presentation. We're going to put it in the chat for you all. Uh, where you're going to get to go in and do a, a experiential deep dive into what's out there about you um, and the really cool part is is that you can do it as as an anonymous person you can do it as if uh, you're not you know you're, you're not logging into your own stuff you can see what other people see about you you can see what's out there um, on the internet for instance your privacy settings around Facebook may be that um, you know everything's set to private However, if somebody pulls your name in one and one or two uh, thread words, um, a portion of your post will still show up in, in Google. And so even though it's set to private in Facebook, Google still picks up, you know, you know, a certain amount um, of the post and it can still, it, it can still show there. Um, and so that's a very good point, um, Anastasia, in terms of HIPAA, in terms of, of using social media as a function of communicating with clients. I have to tell you, my, uh, my general rule is never, never, never. That's not a good practice ever. Things get misconstrued in terms of, of um, how you might know someone, things, um, you know, with breaches of data. Uh, you know, look at Equifax. That's supposed to be one of the most secure servers in the world, and it was hacked. Um, and so it's really like rolling dice. It's like rolling confidentiality dice to say, I'm going to use social media as a manner of interacting with my clients. 
Um, and I'm just going to roll the dice that there's never going to be a breach of information because here's the thing. If there's a breach of information, you still have responsibility in that because you communicated with your clients in such a way that allowed their information um, to become present. It would be like having that consultation on the street corner and not filtering who walks by kind of thing. Dr. Foster, can I jump in for a second? Okay, and I was fixing um, One of the things I also want to point out is when you're communicating by social media, unless there's a video feed, you don't know that you're communicating with the person you think you're communicating with because you don't have client identification. People can send texts, they can post, they can get access to other people's things. So you don't know you're who you're talking to when you're talking in those type of modalities unless you have systems in place for client identification. And I think that's something really important because I think we assume we know who we're talking to, but that's a very dangerous assumption. That's right. And so even in terms of text message, that's a very val valid point. Um, how do you know that who you're texting back and forth with about a Wednesday appointment is really who, it, who they say it is? Um, and that's something that's mundane as, you know, appointment reminding and things like that. And so um, I would challenge you that using social media for client interaction um, is not a practice that I would necessarily engage in. Um, even if my state were to allow it. Um, I, I'd like to hear from some of you guys as we talk about the, the dangers um, in terms of your, your professional livelihood around using social media um, as a mechanism of, of reaching out to clients. How are you feeling about it after today? Um, Dr. Foster, um, I had a question that popped up that maybe others might be interested in hearing the response to. Um, if um, an internship or practicum or licensed, we had a client message us through Facebook or Twitter or another social media modality, what would you recommend doing to um, kind of set those boundaries with the client in order to ensure that that doesn't happen again if you don't want to use social media? Well, I'm going to say this, that all good practice starts out of of a poor practice. And so the reason we know what we know about social media use and, and as counselors, the reason we know about declaration statements and informed consent is out of necessity. Um, and so I would challenge you to think about that, that good practices start in the very beginning. It is explicitly stated in my informed consent in terms of working with clients, how I will and will not communicate with them. Um, I have had, um, people message me on Facebook and say, hey, are you the same Dr. Foster that's my counselor? And I want to speak to the point around um, using a different name on social media. I do. And my client still found me and sent me a message. Um, and I didn't respond to it. And I brought it back up in session to say, hey, um, we need to talk about this um, boundary rupture. Um, because again, it's explicitly stated in my declaration that I do not use social media to communicate with clients. And, and not even once. I mean, that's one of those things that I am just, um, there is a, there is a, it's not a fine line. It is a big, 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 big line between what I will do and what I won't do. Um, because the other thing is whatever they are saying to you, it also puts you on the hook if you respond to it. Um, much like Dr. Ellie said, you're assuming you know that that person is who they say they are. So I do, I do not respond on, on social media. Um, Dr. Ellie, I'm going to call on you for this one too, because if your response is different than mine, I'd, I'd love to hear that. No, it's the exact same thing. It's in my informed consent, you know, so it's something that we start the conversation of during our relationship with it so that it's not a surprise. And I don't respond online because I don't know that it is actually that client. And also most social media transfers of information, like say Facebook Messenger, are not HIPAA compliant. So there's no way to ensure that that's a secure communication method. So that's a no-go for me whatsoever. No, no responses, don't engage. And like you, Dr. Foster, I use my maiden name not my 
person, you know, my professional name and people still find me. They still do. And they still send me invitations and I ignore them. Uh, Dr. L.A. and Dr. Foster, um, some points by Tanisha and Eve. Um, Tanisha stated, I agree with the previous statement about not knowing who you're communicating with, but theoretically it can be the same thing with letters in the mail or telephone calls. Sometimes people sound similar on phone calls. And Eve? Great point. I'm not sure. Can I speak to that one real quick, Anastasia? Because that, um, Tanisha, what I do in my practice, and this is just a good best practice for telehealth in general, is we have either we're using an encrypted system that they need to use a password and able to log into it, or they have to give me some identifying information if I don't recognize their voice, like on the phone. I might say something to my client, like, can you tell me one thing that we talked about during our last session? And that's a way of verifying client identification. It's actually an ethical and legal mandate that we verify clients in all modalities of communication. Um, That kind of leads into what Eve said. Um, She said um, it was pointed out in the telebehavioral health course that a client should use a code word or number to identify themselves. And I was going to speak to that, Eve. I do that in my practice. Um, You know, they have to have the identifier, Um, you know, even when leaving me a message so that I know that, you know, there's the potential that it is. Um, but even that, even leaving messages, there's only certain things my clients uh, should leave messages about. And and some sometimes I get pushback on this from people and they're like, but Dr. Foster, what if it's an emergency? And I'm going to say, we've covered that in my dec- declaration statement. There is a certain protocol if it's an emergency, what you do. And so um, I think that we have to be really considerate of what also is the client trying to communicate and what contingency has been set up for that client should that contingency need to be used. And so, um, because it only takes once and Dr. LA has said on the licensing board and she knows this. And so she'll probably say yes to this, you know, these boundary ruptures in terms of confidentiality and, and uh, giving away client information is the thing that gets people in trouble. Um, yeah. In terms of, of, of licensing. Is, right. When I started on the board, it was dual relationships. When I left the board six years later, just six years, social media had become the number one complaint. So just like you don't want your clients looking you up, I do want to add that you're not, you're not to look up your, your clients. I mean, you shouldn't be trolling your clients on social media, trying to find out anything about them. I do want to make mention of the fact that if you look for somebody on Facebook, there's an algorithm set that that person doesn't necessarily get a notification, but you pop up as somebody they might know. Um, And there's an algorithm set for that. Um, And so unless you are a hundred percent sure of the math and the science um, behind all of it, number one, it's not ethical to do to look up your clients on social media, but number two, there are forces much more powerful than you are. Um, researchers and um, um, marketing researchers and mathematicians and scientists who are connecting all of those dots, supercomputers connecting all of those dots uh, behind your searches. And so I would challenge you to think about um, it's not only your clients looking for you, but it's you looking for your clients as well. Um, that is, that is a, a, that is something that will get you in trouble with your, your licensing board very, very quick. And at the university level, that would be something that would get you in trouble with your, your university very, very quick. You agree with that, Dr. L.A.? Yeah, I was going to say it's kind of creepy because it's kind of like you're going and standing on the public sidewalk and looking in their living room trying to make clinical um, determinations about them by looking in their house. It's very much similar to that. I think it's just creepy. Well, and, and there's the ethical code around extending the boundaries of counseling, and I think that this very much squarely falls in into that. Them contacting you on social media or you contacting them. Um, it's just like me having a conversation with my clients around what will happen if I see them in public. Um, and this I think that we have to think about social media and we have to think about the internet as an extension of the public. 
You wouldn't stand on a street corner and berate or belittle a client or say, Johnny, come see this. Look at him. Look at what he's doing. You know, I can't believe he's in that restaurant with that person. It's the same kind of thing that it's an extension of the, the counseling boundary uh, that wasn't agreed upon. And so they shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. So let's talk about that. So all of this talk about social media. Um, I had a methodologist in my PhD program who would talk about reputation, reputation, reputation. In my PhD program, um, he would tell us the story when social media really became prominent of someone who had some real struggles in the program because of things that she had done online that had surfaced. And, you know, her battle cry was, well, all of that happened previous to my new life, and so none of it counts. And the, the truth is, is that social media does not forget. The internet doesn't forget. And while you may not be able to be held um, legally or ethically, depending on the state you live in, responsible for those things, it still creates a reputation for you. And so I'm going to challenge you guys to think about what does your social media, what is your online presence um, say about you, and are you okay with the reputation that, that you have online? Um, some of our biases that we don't maybe recognize um, we're giving to the world are, are posted in terms of inappropriate comments, photos, memes are the easy way to do it. Um, you know, I'm going to tell one on myself and um, Dr. Duggan, who is, is an adjunct here, and I told him I was going to tell. Um, we have conversations every day in memes, and um, we're very careful about, uh, you know, the little, the little, you click on the little, um, uh, magnifying glass, it pops up all the little memes and things you can use. And um, so I get him, he gets me. And you know, that's how we communicate with each other. Now, would somebody else get that? Or if it was posted online, what would somebody think about that? And so being very conscious, even in your choice of meme, and whether or not um, you're willing to post that. Uh, because again, Everybody filters things through their own world experience, through their, their, their perceptions. And so you may mean it one way and it may come off as another. Um, posting negative remarks about others. Um, so very recently, um, there was a person in our community who was a mental health professional who um, got arrested based on some things that that a client um, reported to the ethics board about him. And um, one of his uh, mental health providers that worked in his office took the social media and said, uh, you know what you did was wrong. You know who you are. You know who I'm talking to. You're ruining someone's life um, all because you didn't get your way kind of thing. And so she was then sanctioned for what she put on social media. So, I mean, that's an extreme case, um, but it may be just as simple as um, somebody posts something and you're saying, right, I can't even. Um, you can be sanctioned for things like that. And so, because again, it's not necessarily how you intended it, um, it's how it's perceived. Um, making racial or discriminatory comments um, I have to tell you that in our political climate, that's probably easier to do than it has been in the, the most recent past. And again, because of the online disinhibition effect, um, some of those effects that we, we talked about, it's sometimes we feel more compelled than ever to share things um, in the world, whether it be through our political lens or um, any other bias that we may have. And so, um, I would challenge you to think about any comments that you made that, you know, someone may perceive as inappropriate. There's also issues of professionalism. You know, just by virtue of being in a professional graduate program uh, with policies in place around um, social media use, around your online presence, um, that's, like I said, the clock doesn't just start the minute you get accepted into a program, the minute you graduate. Um, you know, you're cultivating your professional reputation in all that you do. Um, there are I, I, Susan, I'm sorry, can I jump in real quick? I also want to mention the impact it has on your program. 
you're going to have the same diploma. And when people associate you with a Chicago school and you're bad mouthing or talking about somebody online, they then they connect that to the Chicago school. And so when you get out in the field, then they go, oh, well, I don't want to hire somebody from the Chicago school because they talk bad about people or they're very unprofessional or, you know, they get this perception of not just you, but the perception of the whole program. So when you do those things, it's having an impact on everybody in your program. Um, or, you know, if you're at another school, same thing, you know, if you're at SNU or University of Cumberland or NFI, you know, when you talk bad about somebody, you are affiliated with an organization and that then transfers to the organization, to the program. So just think about the, the chain effect. Well, and I'll also say that, um, you know, in terms of your personal and professional presence online, employers look at your personal presence and they make value judgments on your professionalism based on the things they see about you. Fair, unfair, shrewd, not shrewd. Um, I know from my perspective, you know, I think we should walk online the way we walk in our lives and we should walk saying and doing the things we want people to know about us. And so, um, but with that being said, just like Dr. L.A. said, this is a common practice that people look you up. Um, you know, there. I did a, a quick search um, around this, and you can go in and see. Um, all you have to do is is search people who lost their jobs uh, about social media, and there's the actual post. You can read the post that people put, and then uh, sometimes the employers responded in the post to say thank you, but no thank you. You're, you're no longer, and you know your services are no longer needed, and things like that. And so. Um, especially with what we do, um, background checks are the norm. And so people are going to examine your professional um, identity, and that includes your online professional identity with a microscope. Um, you know, it also shows poor communication skills that if you do something online and you, you, um, you know, per our code of ethics, if we have a concern with somebody, we're to take it straight to the person. Um, and, and try and get resolve around that. So if we're doing those kinds of things online, that really goes A, against our code of ethics, and B, it, it speaks to our poor communication skills. Um, I talked about the misrepresentation of qualifications or accomplishments. You can, be, you can, you can have your license um, sanctioned for that. You can have your certification sanctioned if you're misrepresenting yourself online. Um, so... I would challenge you guys um, to think about what that means in terms of your credibility. Anastasia, do you want to take this one and I'll do the, the last one? Yep. <clears throat> um, did you already do it? Okay. Um, credibility. Uh, your profiles are consistent across sites, locations. They're up to date. Self assertions match actual accomplishments. Excuse me, accomplishments. Others trust you and post positively about you. Your communication skills and style are consistent across channels. Um, it, Eve stated, should we delete our Facebook account even if we have nothing necessarily wrong in our pages? I think that Eve, you're entitled to have social media. Um, and if there's nothing um, wrong, um, and again, wrong is such a broad term. Um, I think you, you should go through, and this, this is an excellent time to bring up this last slide. So this is a social media checking tool. I don't own it. I didn't create it. Um, there is um, the link right there. But basically, you fill out this little block of information, um, and I'm going to see if I can't get it, on, um, before, get it for us before we go. Um, your high school, where you live, um, you know, nicknames, a couple of other things. And this is an Excel spreadsheet, so it's not something that you, um, you can download the tool straight from there. And basically what you get is it populates all of the, all search engines that could possibly use your name, nickname, whatever else the case may be. You can click on those links and you can see in every country, in every corner of the world, what is out there on the internet about you. And so the thing I would say, Eve, before um, you, you make the decision to delete or not delete is to use the tool and see what's out there about you. Now, I have to tell you, I, 
I have a couple of reminders set in my phone. I think that this is a wonderful best practice for everyone to, to, to consider. Um, I know when my state legislature meets and I know when bills, um, when laws are enacted and I know when we get copies of said bills. And so I have, and that's the end of May, for, um, end of April for me. So May the 1st, every May the 1st, regardless of what I'm doing, there is a, 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 an alarm set in my phone to go in and check legislation. So I go in and I check any legislation that could potentially do anything with my license. Uh, social media being one of those things. And so I get a good look at if there have been any board changes, any anything that would create um, something that I need to attend to. The other thing that I do is I have four times a year, I check my social media using this tool. Because again, I want to stress to you, it's not just about what you put out there about yourself, it's what others put out there about you too. You are ultimately responsible for all of it, depending on your state law, but certainly within the code of ethics, you're responsible for how you represent yourself. Um, and so I would challenge you guys to consider using this tool or a tool like this. I mean, you can pay somebody to sweep your social media. You can pay someone to sweep your, um, your online presence. Um, but again, I don't know that I would trust putting that um, in someone else's hands. And so I actually do it once a quarter. Um, Thoughts about the tool, thoughts about using this, thoughts about checking into yourself, seeing what others see. It can be really, really eye-opening. And I've actually found some discrepancies that I had to um, that I had to dispute, and I made sure that I kept copies of all that in case my board asked me about it. Um, and it was because of the use of with this tool, but I, I welcome thoughts around the use of the tool. Uh, Dr. Foster, Eves asks if you could place the link in the chat box, please. Yes, I will. Eva, as quick as I take the presentation down, I will, I will do that. I can't do it from this view. Um, any other thoughts about the tool? So as we, we have about uh, five minutes, but as we get ready to wrap up, any questions, comments, aha moments that any of the group that attended today would like to share? And the, the last slide is just uh, references, if you want to know more. Um, Eve, you said you were able to, um, to record this, right? Yes, I was. Awesome, wonderful. So um, Anastasia, Ashley, and I, um, we welcome any comments, feedback, if anybody has anything around um, this topic and you, you want to... Um, you want to have a chat about it? Uh, we're more than willing, and I mean, Dr. L.A. is a is an authority on this as well. So here is the checking tool. Let me see if I can open it real quick um, and share my screen just to show you guys what it looks like and where to find it. Um, yeah, there we go. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so if you see the social media checking tool for job seekers and graduates, right? You see me scrolling? Uh, yes. Wonderful. So if you go all the way down to the bottom of this, here is the tool, which you can open it in, in Excel. And hopefully it still shows my screen. Can you still see my screen? Yes. So you see the Excel spreadsheet? No. Okay, let me let me switch screens real quick. Share. Here we go. Can you guys see my screen now and you see an Excel spreadsheet? Yes. So it's asking you to fill in these personal details about yourself. And then as you do this, all of these queries come up where you can log in and check. 
and you're checking it based off of your hometown or city, your current hometown or your current city, uh, the high school you attended, the college you attended, the university you attended, the countries you've lived in, hobbies that you have, sports that you've played, any job sectors. So all the things we would normally post about, um, you know, it cross checks every bit of this against anything that's out there. And I think it's interesting like that MySpace and Bebo and things like that are still listed on here um, for those of you that had those in the past, because the thing is that if you can find it, someone else can too. And so I would challenge you guys to take a look at the tool. Like I said, I found stuff about myself that's not, um, that's not accurate. And it came through the use of um, looking through Google. So other, other thoughts um, as we wrap up? Any final questions? Okay. I just want to remind you to post that link in the chat box, please. Oh, I, I think I've posted it to Anastasia privately. Let me, let me go back and make that public. Sorry. Sorry about that, Eve. Good catch. Can you see it now, everybody, the link? I can. Thank awesome. you. Okay. Um, so you know we're listed in the directory here at the Chicago School. If you um, if you want any further follow up or conversation around this, um, I'm S. Foster. Um, please feel free, free to reach out. As a matter of fact, Anastasia, why don't you just put your email in the chat box for anybody that uh, would want to reach out because we have people from our university here as well. All right. Did you want me to stick Ashley's information in there too? Absolutely, thank you. Okay. So there's our information. Feel free to contact us um, if you have any questions, comments, as, as you begin to consider what this looks like and means for you. Um, and I hope that you were able to get some wonderful takeaways today regarding social media use. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Foster. Hi. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Foster, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Foster. <laughs>